Hello and welcome to the 42 Roby Show in association with Cadbury Boost. We're coming live from the beautiful studio here at Facebook HQ in Dublin today as we look back on the 2017 Six Nations. Joining us to review the campaign is former Ireland centre Lynn Cantwell. And in this episode, we'll discuss Ireland's defensive grit in their victory over England on Saturday, look at how Peter O'Mahony changed their line out, discuss their attacking play under Joe Schmidt in this championship, and we'll also run through our Lions teams as the Tour Team New Zealand comes into view. Keep your questions coming on Facebook, of course, and we'll answer some of those during the show. Lynn, thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. Ireland finished in second place. A really high positive note to end on, but looking at that championship overall, how will they reflect on that? Yeah, I think they definitely would have set out to win it and they'll be disappointed that they didn't win it. I think ultimately they'll probably gain more from coming second and, and the difficult battles that they've had to do, lose two games and then try and come back and, and beat some serious outfits. Um, so I think in the long term they'll probably get more from it. Like, do you think November was such a high, incredible. Like, it even seems so recent and fresh. Has there been progress or are we judging a different kind of thing? Because Joe Schmidt often references, you know, it's tough for young guys playing in Six Nations as opposed to November. Do you think they've progressed or are we, are we judging something very different? Yeah, I think we have progressed. I think I read this morning that hasn't Joe has, um, uh, has, has blooded 20 new players yeah. since 2015. You know, we're seeing those come through now. It was 10, 15 minutes of that pitch where there's two or three new caps. So that's just phenomenal to still be able to beat England. So I think we have seen more. I think we've been able to keep the stability and what we produced in, um, against New Zealand, but just added more, you know, and seeing that second tier of, of players coming through. Yeah, a lot of new caps. Andrew Conway came on again. Another new cap, Dan Levy, even at the end, was yeah. some important actions. Kieran Marmion stepping up. Luke McGrath, yeah. Luke McGrath, <laughs> that kick in the end, really, yeah, really sure. Yeah. Joe was loving that kick. Yeah. He mentioned it a few times afterwards. It was amazing. But I mean, in terms of building towards that 2019 World Cup, we, I guess a guy like Joe Schmidt always has to consider that strategy longer term as well as those short-term goals, goals, it must be a difficult job. Oh, it certainly is, you know, and, and I think it'd be, it would be irresponsible not to, um, but I think you can understand in, in most coaches' era in their campaign, you can understand why they want to just do the best out of what the time that they are there. But, you know, in order for Ireland to continue to compete at a world stage, which is our ultimate goal, we need to see these other players coming through, and, and that's what he's starting to do now. But what's most impressive is that these guys are coming on, and it's flawless. You know, it's not impacting on the game plan at all. They know exactly where they should be. Going back to Luke McGrath, I don't know whether that was part of a game plan or not, but yeah. myself and Fiona Cochran were watching the game. We both looked at each other going, oh my God, it's three <laughs> minutes to go. I can't believe this happened but that's just a sign of amazing confidence and hopefully more things to come yeah like there are there are frustrations in this campaign I don't think we can kind of gloss over everything like that first 30 minutes in, in Murrayfield was pretty disastrous you know they put themselves in a horrible position I know Joe was livid about that bus and maybe that'll go down the history as <laughs> uh, infamous but there was frustrations there in, in Wales as well you know that mole penalty was close but Ireland probably didn't use their possession as well as they could have I mean there are areas they let themselves down in do, do you think they were that close as Joe Schmidt continually insists or were there maybe issues to look at? No, like I think in the past um, things probably were closer. Um, I, think, I think clearly there were, there were more problems, not problems that can't be solved in this campaign, but there were a lot of, you know, in the Wales game there was a lot of handling errors, a lot of mistakes, things like that that, you know, are, are easier to change but definitely need to be changed. You can't win the Six Nations on those kind of things. So um, I think in general um, it's a truer reflection of, of the campaign and where Ireland did finish. Yeah, a lot of kind of national of, of the teeth over the defence at, at times <coughs> in this championship, giving up quite a few tries in, in certain games. Andy Farrell came in for some criticism. Um, did you think that was back at a peak maybe against England on Saturday in that 13-9 win? Yeah, certainly, as in, do I think that they've, they've, they've corrected it, they've solidified yeah. what their defensive system should be? Yeah, absolutely. Like when you speak to the players and when you speak to the players, they don't seem phased at all by their defensive system. They don't seem worried about the fact that they're, they're conceding space out wide. Yes, it does definitely to me sometimes, um, but they seem to have it under control, and they certainly did uh, when they went wide um, against England. Yeah, like to keep them uh, trialless was a really good achievement, mm -hmm. especially considering what we'd seen from the English tack. I think they took out certain aspects of that English game plan and and made them kind of try things that they didn't want to do at times. We're going to look at an example of, of the Irish defence, just to kind of sum up that attitude they brought, that line speed they brought, and, and how they shut down England and shoved that pressure back onto them. Um, in this example, we see in the top left uh, corner here, it's Jonathan Joseph, that first receiver. He's clearly, clearly signifying that he wants the ball. Um, and Gary Ringrose picks it out. You know, he's given a cue with his hand up in the air, but Gary Ringrose still makes a, a pretty um, ballsy decision, especially that close into Rook. He's going to rush up on his own. I'm just going to go and I'm going to smash this guy and try and shut down the play. And we move over to image two on the top right and we can see that 
you know, Joseph still gets the ball away, but it, the ball's going to go to ground um, and put a Toje here in a, in a difficult position, kind of going back on the ball. But what happens is Peter O'Mahony and Ian Henderson here, they kind of follow that leadership from Ringrose and they keep that line speed going up. Even with numbers out here for England, you know, a, a good pass off the deck and you could potentially be in trouble. But Ireland are just kind of savage in that intensity. And Henderson drives into Itoje, shoves him into the ground in the way that Itoje has done to so many others. I mean, is that, is that the kind of blueprint for Ireland now defensively? Certainly, what I really enjoyed about those passages play and, and many other passages of play in Ringrose spearheading it was just sensational for such a young man, um, is to have your defensive structure, but when you see an opportunity to be able to individually pump out of the line because you see an, see an opportunity and taking it, um, that is fabulous to be able to see that, but also the players around you to be able to react to say, OK, I see that you've done that, our, our defensive system has changed now, and I'm going to back the decision that you've made and make the best of it, and they certainly did. Yeah, there's kind of like a contradiction almost in that, though, because we always hear coaches going, you know, he didn't stick to the system, um, and yet we want to see a guy go and make the decision and actually shoot up at times. Where is the, how's that decision-making process come about, or where do you actually go, this is my opportunity? Yeah, you I, know, I, well, as, a, as a former 13. Yeah, it's difficult, and I know it's... Um, I suppose my taking it is, well, it's only a mistake if you let it be a mistake. So if, 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 if Ringrose has blitzed out of the line, which he did, um, I think it was a really good read for him. He thought that he could get it, he had confidence to get it. If the other boys had said, that's an error in our defensive system, I'm going to let you go there, then that would have been a really, really bad outcome. But they said, no, our defensive system has changed slightly to be able to blitz now, as opposed to hold off, um, and therefore we're going to follow you up and put pressure on. So di different teams will call different things. I think England against us used to just call it a kill ball. If anybody makes a mistake, that's the time when everybody's going backwards. So from from a defensive point of view, you want to put a lot of pressure on to be able to capitalise on that mistake. Yeah, I like that. I like the terminology. <laughs> Sounds like something Andy Farrell would, would definitely like as well. One of the other aspects of that defence from Ireland that really stood out was the, the choke tackle. Two big, two big choke tackles. It wasn't like they were doing 10 or 20 choke tackles, but two really important ones just coming up to half time, uh, which we're going to have a look at here. Um, the second one was actually after about 54 minutes when England had gained momentum into the game and Ireland needed a big play and Johnny Sexton actually came up with it. A very similar example to this actually. Um, we see here in the top left corner of our screen here, Sexton goes in, uh, a high tackle, he's always got that high tackle focus on Owen Farrell off a scrum. Really good job from the Irish forwards to, to shove England back, so put them under pressure. Um, so high tackle initiated by Sexton and then Henshaw, oh, Henshaw just here. Really important, he wraps the kind of upper body. He, d he doesn't focus on the ball at all. He says, I'm, I'm just going to wrap his upper body so he can't drop to the ground. You can see just here that Farrell's already kind of fighting. And he gets the ball free here, and there's maybe a little window for an opportunity. But Sean O'Brien here has come in. He's almost doing Sexton's initial job, and that allows Sexton to kind of re-engage on, on the ball there and just hold Farrell off the ground. I mean, technically, are, are we seeing little things like that from Ireland get back to where, where they need to be? Yeah, certainly. I think... Um you, you see Sexton tries to do this quite a lot, but I think his ability to make a decision on whether to follow through with it or whether to pull out of it is, is wh where he makes most gains from. I think if he chooses to go high in his tackle and if he realises that he hasn't got the choke on, he'll just pull out straight away and then just um, re rejoin the line, which is completely fine. Whereas in this instance, I think he's really highly aware that that's Farrell. He says, you know, I've got your number, I've got a good latch on here. And then before you know it, equally, the two boys around him just say, OK, I see this opportunity again. And they make the most of that opportunity. That's, that's fab. Yeah, because the other guy was Haskell, who you would imagine is very good upper body strength. Is that... Maybe Sexton going, I know this guy kind of runs a bit upright, tapping yeah. Henshaw and go, let's go. Is that, is that how it works on the, on the pitch? Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine it is. But I suppose it, it does depend, I think, because Ringrose um, made a, a sensational tackle on Haskell at one stage as well. So yeah. maybe it's a, just a reflection of the attitude of, of those boys. I don't think Sexton ever um, is ever underconfident going into anything on a rugby pitch at the moment. So I think regardless if it was Haskell or if it was you know, uh, Webb, you know, it's small and, and big, then uh, I don't think he was going to back the other team. Yeah, we'll come back to Johnny in relation to Ireland's attack. I think we're going to take a question uh, from, from our live audience just to get us rolling and, and it, the line out I guess is a big issue. I think our question is relating to that. Nigel O'Neill has been in touch. He says, do you agree that now, surely after Saturday, it confirms that Peter O'Mahony must start? Name on everyone's lips, Peter O'Mahony. He loves playing against England, I think. But is he, has he now proven the point that, you know, 
Peter Manny has to start in, in Ireland's back row? Yeah, I think Peter Manny had an amazing game and he was well deserved of man of the match. I think it's more, this weekend was more a reflection on him as a person and a player, as the ability to stand up and do the best job possible for the team. I think the reality is that Peter has been coming back from, from injury. You know, he's, we know that he's a sensational line at operator in Munster and has shown that again and again, but he is coming back. So I think his, his um, exclusion from the team is not necessarily um, something that it was in his control to a certain degree. I think other players were playing well and he was coming back and when he got his time to shine, he most certainly did. Yeah, but I mean, let's say, let's say Ireland are playing again this coming weekend. How do you pick that back row? Does, does it depend, as you mentioned, the line-out? Does it depend on the opposition line-out? Or is a guy like Sean O'Brien now under pressure? He probably hasn't been at his peak. I know he takes longer than some guys to get back to his full fitness, but a lot of handling errors again at the weekend. It looks like he's trying mm. almost too hard. And yeah. you know he gets the ball, he goes, I'm going to run over someone here, and forgets to catch the ball. I don't know, it wasn't a vintage championship from him, but I guess it's that balance in the back row, isn't it? Like Peter Manny is a six, CJ Sander is a six yeah. slash eight. Yeah. Played really well at eight. Mm. Maybe he, he sips the guy under pressure. Do you think Schmidt will treat it on that basis? Again, presuming that everyone's fit all the time, mm. which is unlikely. But, you know, Ireland, front line, how, how are they going to treat that back row? Really? Yeah, I know. There's so many variables, isn't it? Um, yeah. I suppose you'd have to think, um, I'd hope that um, every selection is based on the opposition as well as mm. present form. So it's not a cop-out, but that a horse, horses for courses type of an approach can sometimes be the most um, the most useful way of looking at it. Um, if you need a, a line-out operator, if you need a, a big ball carrier, Peter's your man, you know, if, if potentially, I, I, you know, Sean O'Brien, still we want to see him coming back to form. Yeah. He is just a fabulous, fabulous player, but you do see every time he's making breaks now, it's fabulous to see him, to see those hamstrings of his just letting go, which is yeah. great. But then adding that extra little pass, that uh, offload, we want to be able to see that because he obviously attracts two, three players every time he makes a break. So he's creating a lot of space for um, other people out wide. We just want to see that execution to yeah. be able to... Yeah, and, he, and he's doing everything else really well. Like, we always tend to focus on his ball carrying, but... And that's probably where he's getting criticised now. Is that oh, you know he needs to make more breaks, but his uh, his breakdown stuff is always really good. His defensive work rate is massive. You hear him on the ref, like him and Jamie Heaston in particular, are just non-stop. It's mm. a nightmare for referees. They're always shouting Johnny as well, like <laughs> always at it. But um, we want to actually look at, at a couple of examples of the aforementioned line-out skills that O'Mahony brings. It was just so crucial in this game. Ireland really dominated the line-out against an English line-out that has been superb in this competition. Itoje, Launchbury, Laws, three brilliant jumpers, whereas Ireland only had those two jumpers. Um, we're, we're looking at the Irish try here in the first half. Uh, top, left, top left for a screen. They throw to the tail. Um, a really ballsy call, I guess, considering what had happened with their, with their five-metre line-out. Um, the interesting thing from the English defence here is it's a counter-drive. There's no... There's no actual attempt to sack uh, the, the line-out jumper, and they didn't do that at all throughout this game. I thought they might have changed their tactics a little bit, considering they weren't getting that success. Um, and it plays in Ireland's favour here because they go from the tail of the line-out and they kind of shift off to the right, and England actually kind of accentuate that drive a little bit. Um, they actually work against themselves. really important little detail here is that as Henderson, we see him just here, he's breaking away. But you've actually got a CJ, Han CJ Stander rather, just away to the left here. He was slightly in front of the ball, um, and if we remember the game against um, Scotland, in the first round, Ireland got done for this kind of obstruction ahead of the ball. Uh, when the guys in front of the ball carry didn't break away, uh, Sander is really intelligent here. He recognised that and he gets a little kind of block actually on, on Launchbury here and opens up the, the door. Uh, really strong finish from, from Henderson here just to, to score. But I, I want to ask you about the strategic decision to back that again because they, they were under pressure. You know, the five metres chances hadn't worked. Um, how encouraging is it for players and team this early in the game as well, or at this stage of the game rather, that they go and they back themselves and they actually pull it off. Yeah, absolutely. And again, what I'm impressed with Ireland with is their ability to adapt and change throughout the whole campaign. And, you know, there's reasons for them to have not gone for that based on things that have happened in the past. Yeah. But they did, um, within this game... You can see, for whatever reason, England weren't defending and um, weren't jumping in the line out defensively. So you'd imagine that, therefore, they were trying to just counter whatever was coming on the ground. They weren't necessarily doing that. So we had a nice line out go to the tail, as you say, which is most vulnerable for um, most vulnerable from an English defence point of view to be able to maul off. They got it. They got it down, and you're not going to stop. Ian Henderson um, from that far out, so really, really well executed. And as you say, I didn't spot the CJ Sander just nudging off that time, so that was just learned from the last time and well executed. Yeah, Ireland are master cheats as well. <laughs> we know that. Um, Joe won't like that one, but, but that's, that's the way it is. You mentioned England's line of attacks there, but like overall their game plan, just before we touch on another line example, what, what do we see from them? Are we surprised at what they brought in this game? 
I don't know, their game plan at times, even the first time they had possession, kick away, second time kick away, then the third time they actually attack, but they go right at the fringes where Ireland, you know, they lap that up. The issues for Ireland in defence have been make us get around the corner, make us get our folding right, our spacing right, and hit us wide. And England have shown a bit of that, mm. but we didn't really see it. Was that, do you think, a strategic decision? We're going to bully these guys, or was it Ireland negating their strengths? Mm. Well, that's it. I know we spoke earlier about sometimes it's hard to decipher between are a team very well or are the opposition playing poorly. Yeah. Um, you'd, you'd expect England to play well because you know that they can, but... Um, I'm not too sure. I wonder whether, uh, similar to their poor reactions when they played Italy to cope with that change in tactics until 35, 30 whatever minutes, um, equally they were surprised with what Ireland threw at them and they didn't respond well. And I think it was only the 33rd minute um, in one of the English defensive lineouts where they actually countered one of Ireland's malls off at you know, 33 minutes into a game. You know, a lot of the games, like Ireland saw against Scotland, a lot of the game is lost by that stage. Mm. So, like England. I know we're focusing on Ireland here, but amazing streak. <coughs> I've done so well on, under, under Eddie Jones. And he's already talked, after the match, you know, he goes, that was like a World Cup final out there. I want my players to learn from that for November the 2nd at 8 p.m. Like he had the date and time of the World yeah. Cup final in his mind. I actually love the way he goes and says, this is what we're going to go and, and do. Maybe a little bit of pressure in 2019, <coughs> but they seem to have a little bit of way to go on, on their journey, do you think? I think so. And I think... Um Although these are all professional players, I think we still have to be realistic and look at the age profile. I like the fact that the, you know the age profile of Ireland, as we sped, said before, is 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 um, you know mid twenties, and that's a, that's a little bit different to what it was before. That's great. That shows lots of potential for change. But equally, the English age profile is quite young, and maybe this is just a little bit of greenness that we saw right there in a couple of the campaigns. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to continue the Peter Manny loving just for one more example. <laughs> uh, just you know, a big moment. We talk about big players making big plays. It's such a cliche, but this is 74th minute. England get a penalty after Henshaw kind of struggles to get out of a rock. They kick down the line. You know, this is the moment uh, that they're going to kind of go and seize the game in their heads. We have the line out here in the top left. Um, England run a six-man line out. Tom Wood's on the pitch at this stage. Um, and he kind of shifts to the back of the line out uh, with Itoje coming forward. Ireland's reads all day were really good. Uh, Eddie Jones mentioned afterwards that Itoje was under a little bit of pressure calling for the first time in a game of this magnitude. Um, and Omani and Toner actually both, they're just here at the front of the line, towards the front of the line, they both read it. And actually Toner even has a little plant for his own jump, he thinks he's going up, but Peter Omani has a very different idea. Um, his, his vertical leap is just incredible. Watching it live again, like, it's, it's amazing on TV, but the way he gets off the ground, it's incredible. It reminds you of, you know, if you see behind the scenes in a film where they're getting someone to fly. He's got a cord coming out his back and he just soars up, it's, it's quite incredible. Just like that. Uh, it, yeah, it's an incredible athletic uh, ability, but... Gets in front of Toje, probably could actually win a penalty here, but it's a brilliant, brilliant steal. Um, Luke McGrath kicks, box kicks away, Anthony Watson knocks on the ball, <laughs> essentially game over. Like, but for, for, for teammates, that's just, I guess, a massive play when you get something like that. Oh, certainly, I think it was a two, two steals and definitely um, um, one more, one near steal. Uh, for Peter Mouse, fabulous, really, really, really well. Again, just so attitude. Um, again, just that reacting to the play um, and to be able to capitalise on, on what England are doing. And maybe, you know, you mentioned earlier, I think it was Toje was calling the line-outs for England, but that was a first for him. So maybe just a few mistakes for him that Ireland capitalised on. Yeah, absolutely. Ian Henderson actually did a good job for Ireland. He shared the calling with, with Donica Ryan, I think, but some, some really smart calls in the line. Listen, we want to talk about Ireland's attack. Uh, I think we have a shot at Johnny Sexton, the man for Ireland. You know, everything runs through him. Did you see that again in this game, that, that he was the, <coughs> the only playmaker there? Or are there signs maybe that they're, they're kind of shifting on from that little bit? Yeah, um, I think we, we, we spoke earlier about um, hoping to always have two or three playmakers in the back line because it's just been harder to defend. I think we saw Payne definitely being that and stepping up to that role. Um, in one or two examples that we're going to talk through, he just offered that backdoor option, that second line of defence option, which just makes it ultimately way more difficult to defend. And yeah, it's, it's really interesting actually, like, again, watching live you have certain advantages, but watching Jared Payne on the pitch is one of those because, uh, you know, the camera's so zoomed in when you're watching TV, you don't get a sense of who's in the backfield organising, and Jared Payne is one of those guys, you know, he's not shouting at everyone, he, he gets across, you have a quick word in Johnny Sexton's ear, like, this is what we're going to run. Uh, we did a bit of analysis last night on the 42, and just to kind of highlight that, but really clever off the ball, mm. really good movement, um, and he adds so much in that regard. You mentioned him as a kind of second wave attacker. We're, we're going to look at the example here. Uh, possibly one of Ireland's best attacking phases in this championship, I think. Really encouraging. Um, they're playing off this rook, uh, far left side, 
Um, it's just, it's, you know, a really clever play. Uh, Johnny Sexton's here. He's the first receiver on the left. But what we actually get is, is Robbie Henshaw instead on the, on the right-hand side. Not the most comfortable first receiver still. And actually, in this example, if you kind of scroll the play back a couple of phases, you can see Ty Furlong in midfield shouting at him, you know, give me a call. I want to know. That's Ty Furlong just here. He wants to know the call. Eventually, Henshaw does step up. But I think Payne, obviously, is going to play a role in that as well. He's communicating. Listen, I'm at the back door. So Henshaw here in our, in our second image shifts the ball onto Furlong. Um, and he kind of challenges that English defence. He, he kind of just takes two more steps forward uh, just here at them and Best comes on this hard line on his outside, just tying down that midfield. Um, and he, then Furlong slips that backdoor pass, which Ireland have done well at times. But the key is that, you know, Payne's up flat. He's putting his skills under pressure and you see just here he's got the pass away. He's drawn forward up out of that line, putting himself under pressure. He hits ring rows uh, and really good skills. He, he attacks that inside shoulder. Elliot Daly has to bite in. Um, and probably Ireland centres haven't quite done that in the championship. They haven't really sat down their man, their man much. We've got that scenario set up here on, on our beautiful Spudio table. Um, just talk us through the, those principles and what it's doing to the English defence and, and I guess the thinking behind the Irish play. Um, well, I suppose if you're uh, an English defensive line, if you're looking at two lines of defence, automatically what you're trying to decipher between, them, between yourselves is, well, what is our line speed going to be like? If, it is going, if it's going to go back door, then our line speed needs not be fast because obviously we need to back off to be able to allow the Irish team to go back door, pass it out and then, and then shift across to be able to push into touch as such. Um, if it's not going to be, then we can just initiate good quick flying speed and just kind of snuffle you out um, at the 13 channel. So th those kind of dynamics are, and those communi that, that communication is going on amongst the defensive line. So, and, and, and decisions have to be made within there. And, and whilst that, that, those, that chat is going on, errors can be made. You know? So it's, yeah. just, it's just opportunities made. Sorry, you, you had mentioned even the actual configuration or who was in the, the English yeah. defence was important in this example. Yeah, definitely. And I'm not too sure whether it was identified or not or whether that this was a power play, but two or three phases before this has come from a scrum. And then I think we a pain takes it into contact here where that rock formation was was in your original yeah. video. But what we have out in the back line is you've got literally one, two, three. So the whole front row are there. These but three guys, yeah, yeah, with Elliot Daly outside. Um, and this is against a, a, a full up, yeah. a full back line. So you know the back door option is, is brilliant. I'm not too sure whether Payne deliberately sets up inside Henshaw. Um, him being inside Henshaw obviously just engages, as you mentioned, Farrell, but he'll naturally be faster to be able to get on the outside. So um, it was a Henshaw, Henshaw obviously passed a yeah, pass then. furlong. Yeah. And then just within within the phase within the space of two, three seconds, obviously it allows Payne just time to get around the outside and then just uh, unleash Ring Rose, who does really, really well, well with his feet. All he has to do is a draw and pass to Earlsy in the, yeah. in the in the corner to make probably fifteen yards. And getting the kind of ball he probably didn't get at all really in this yeah. championship. I would say really enjoyed that. They did cough up the ball though on the very next phase, they get down to the far left corner. I think Marmion tries to slip a pass and it goes forward. But they get into this zone again. There was another example where Payne busts through on, on kick return in the second mm. half. Really encouraging to see, although really poor English defence. Those, those chances, converting those chances, is that still mm. something uh, that's an issue for Ireland? Are we judging them to too high a standard and we're almost expecting to try every single time? What do you, what do you think about that? No, like I do think, I think that um, those things are the most important things. We spoke about effectiveness, I think, um, a good few times. Realistically, how you win games is you score points. In order to score points, you have to realistically be in your 22 to score a try or to get a penalty. So if you get into your 22 and you don't come away with points, that's that's a bad notch against your name. So mm. um, I think at one stage, yeah, Keith Earls made that break and then Marmion small little lock on. I think earlier on in the day, Keith Earls did actually make a break. He knocked it on. We got it. We got a penalty from that. But a couple of times, and then I think when Payne made his break, and I don't think we capitalised from that as well. Um, if you if you do so well to make those breaks and make that yardage, you really need to be coming away with something. Yeah, we should mention Roy Best's reverse pass in that <laughs> Earls example. Yeah, he yeah. got pulled off for HIA afterwards because I think it was, they were so surprised he threw the pass. <laughs> Incredible bit of skill with penalty bench pain. But um, I mean, they do. I, I just feel they get into those zones and and they're almost relying on this is our structure. I, I think you have a similar thought process. Is there a bit more space within Ireland's attacking play for 
guys like, I don't know, Ringrose, individuals to maybe make a bit more of a play to you? Yeah, like I think my thought process probably as a um, as an outside back is always to try and be a little bit more individual, and, and I'm, I'm sure that I'm hated by plenty of people who like structure. But you know that's the beauty, the beauty of the game. Exactly, the combination of both I think is the ultimate. And what I like, you know, what I, what I do love to see, I suppose, when we see Super 15 rugby, um, I, I just think that. You're, if, if you're if you're very threatening as an individual, if you can beat your one and on one player, then that's that's a really threatening thing to do. So if you've got 15 players on a on a pitch that have the ability to make it difficult for the defence, and the defence have to reorganise um, themselves each time when you have the your hands on the ball, then that's really really hard, and the space are going to open up. Yeah. Do Ireland have those players though? Like I think maybe Joe would even argue he's never said that blatantly on the record, but he often says, you know, I can only work with these guys a couple of times during the week. I can't improve their skills. You th you think the players are there to actually? Be backed to do a bit more of that. Um, I think they are. I think you're right. I think there's probably um, th if if we had a higher skill base across the board, we probably would have a little bit more freedom and then it, for that, those type of skills to be a little bit more instinctive. I think that will come. Uh, you know, as we spoke, I think Johnny was saying the last time. You know, the, the Leinster backs that are coming through are sensational. Yeah. You know, the schools rugby is just sensational. So those skills are being practiced at a at a way younger age now, and we're seeing the national team producing them again and again. So it's probably it's only a matter of time. The next year or so, we're starting to get that. Yeah, some great work being done. David Newswar again, a kind of controversial figure at times, but he is doing good work with that next crop and they're going younger 15 yeah. 16 year olds and bringing them through that decision making is always key and one of the other things we wanted to mention just briefly was the the rock decision making breakdown rock <coughs> on both sides of the ball really from ireland we have an example here of good decision making from ireland and um, england on the attack in their 22 that kind of wild passage of play that left jared payne almost needing to be hospitalized he was so out of breath but understandably it was incredible uh donica ryan's making a tackle here um, and we can see that uh, sorry there we can see that uh Rory Best is just hovering. He's waiting for that tackle to be completed. Um, and when he pounces down over the ball, he gets Peter O'Mahony just on his right side, almost like a turnover assist. Oh, I kind of turn them when I'm doing that analysis. But what, what you get then is Billy Vunapola trying to clear out O'Mahony rather than Best. Best is almost hidden. He has Toje kind of trying to smash him off the ball here. But uh, O'Mahony kind of gives him a shield almost. He's like blocking. And then Vunapola pulls O'Mahony to here. So now there's actually a kind of barrier in front of, of Best. And you see Haskell has to resort to kind of jumping over the top. Now there's probably question marks around whether Ireland were actually on their feet, the, the usual kind of stuff. But I think Jerome Garces was letting an awful lot go uh, and you played a ref. In terms of that decision making, we didn't really see a whole lot of this from, from Ireland in the championship. They did compete. There weren't too many successful steals, but... Do you feel there's a bit of a way to go in that decision-making process on both sides of the ball? Yeah, I think um, something that Scotland did very well against Ireland in the first game is I think that they chose to commit numbers to the rook when they needed to um, and when to try and go for the steal or the jackal when they needed to, only when it was very, very specifically on and if it wasn't, they would just fan out, which made it really hard for Ireland because I don't know if we identified... Um, that quick enough, you know. So obviously, if you haven't got defensive players committing to the rook, and um, then the space is behind the rook. Whereas if you have got players committing to the rook, then the space is going to be elsewhere. Whereas I think we were we're not necessarily reading well what um, Scotland were doing and, and, and playing where there was more players than where there was less players, you know, which is okay. what you're looking at. So I think something like that, if we can flick that onto Ireland, I think sometimes we make some really good decisions like Rory did there um, to rob when needed and obviously in our in our red zone and um, when you're defending your own line. Um, but equally, I think sometimes we probably go for balls that are not on or don't go for balls that are on. So yeah, just need to tidy a, up It's there. a tricky one because you're trying to fill the defensive line. Like, What's your experience? Is that improved by analyzing the game or is that improved on the training pitch how do you yeah i think it's all decision making you know um, as i said the the standard that the boys are playing is 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 top notch you know it is it's hugely advanced um, but there's more you know if we talk about the decision making that johnny the decision making process that johnny will go through when he's deciding where they want to play in the pitch and what they want to do or the decision making over Mahoney, do i jump do i not what do i go for this ball they're all really really split second decisions it's not that they're um they're their kind of higher level decisions. It's not as if they have not been through those processes before, but they've been through those processes. I've done this before. I've seen this on video. I've practiced this in training again and again and again, and then they just become way, way more advanced. So that's the process. Okay. okay. Really interesting stuff. It's going to be exciting to see Ireland. They've got that tour of Japan and the USA, obviously, to come, but further down the line, I guess, against Tier 1 nations again. We're going to have to wait a while. What we do have to look forward to in terms of international rugby in particular is, is the Lions tour. Um, We've kind of hesitated from going there every week and doing our team 
Lions team of the weekend stuff, but now it's time to fully commit to it. Um, <laughs> we've been going forward and back with our, with our teams. We, we gave you the easy task of, of selecting a Lions team, um, and I think you've changed it once or twice. <laughs> uh, I won't mention which Irish player got dropped at the last minute, but uh, we, have your, we have your team up here. Talk I us through. I had myself in there at 13 for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, was in, I was on the right wing of mine. Talk us through how you, how you went about deciding how you think that reflects what Warren Gatlin is thinking through. Yeah, similar to you, I was interested when you actually get down to put a pen to paper, um, I realised how much incredible brawn we have to select from. And then when I reflected and I looked back on, or not looked back, and I tra or cross transferred to uh, the ABs and see what, what players they have to select from, I just thought that we have a serious amount of brawn in our pack particularly, and I was trying to um, change it around to try and get a little bit more of a dynamic back row okay. um, and that's where that's where I tweaked a few things so I think that um, often people go to play New Zealand and try and play like them um, and I don't think there's any team that can play like them in, in how dynamic they do play so I think Ireland are probably right to go for Braun and I think that that's what Gatlin likes as well and that's why we've just got some serious ball carriers and I tried to just put in a, a good few um, good options for line outs there um, yeah. But uh, I, I would personally like to see a little bit more of a dynamic just ball carrier in the back row. But um, as I said, I think that's playing to our strengths. Yeah, Alan Wynne Jones gets an as captain. Uh, we're going to bring on my team in a second as well. I actually went for that, but talk us through why you think that's a, a good decision to have him as captain. Um, I think the Lions Tour, similar to a World Cup, uh, the dynamics change quite a lot in that because it's a Lions Tour and you've got three teams that are coming, four teams, sorry, that are coming to play together, I think the dynamics of the team and pulling them all together is going to be really, really key. So I think you need a captain that has the ability to recognise that, that's not going to kind of roil people up the wrong way, that's going to really appreciate everybody's differences and try and collectively bring together to buy into the Lions culture. Um, and I think that, you know, he most certainly is a, is a, as a likeable fella as well as a damn hard worker. So I think he'll set the tone. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to bring up my team as well. And I went for Alan Wynne Jones is captain as well. I think, as you mentioned, he's, he's a likeable guy, good bloke, has kind of amateur values almost. And I don't know, Dylan Hartley, does he really bring a group together? He's a bit of a divisive character. Rory Best, I, I don't know, I wonder about the English guys coming in and going, I don't really know Rory Best. But Alan Wynne Jones makes sense. I think he's pretty much odds on favour now, and Gatland really likes him. There's my team. Same pack, um, same back row again. Slight concerns over the line out maybe, but Sam Warburton can be your third jumper, and CJ can do a bit of a job as well. Uh, the backs, we have, we have a different back three or we same full back but I've gone for Tommy Seymour on the right wing uh, I just think he's so solid as well as bringing that game breaking ability um, really determined guy really good in the air uh, defensively sound um, and Liam Williams I think has been in exceptional form for Wales I guess talk your, your back three selection is different you have North and, and Elliot Daly why did you end up going for them? Yeah um, why did I go with them? I think, I think similarly I think the Oh, the New Zealand backs are going to be um, quite a, like a force to contend with. I think North is 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 really really difficult to defend. I think he's he's a he's a guy that he's you know two or three players are going to have to commit to to be able to take him down, which is going to create space elsewhere. Um, Daly's just just solid as a house. You know he's, he has that kicking option as well. Um, so I suppose that's probably def picking a defensive backline as opposed to more of a tackle. I probably see uh, Joe Joseph, my, my main threat, and Hogg, my main kind of creative threat, which I like yeah. in there. And um, obviously, like we spoke earlier, having Sexton and Farrell, one on each side of the rook, I think that's going to be just really hard to defend. Yeah, it makes a difference. I went for Henshaw at 13, even though he's been playing 12. He's got experience there with Connacht and Leinster, I think. And I do think Alan will go for a bit more directness at, at 13. Farrell can kind of create and um, play off Johnny, as, as you mentioned. Uh, I just think Henshaw just he's such a good athlete, such a good competitor that he's so difficult to leave out. He always he always gives you those big moments of, mm. of contact, of of carry, of tackle. Um, I kind of it's 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 a shame he hasn't developed an, a different way with Ireland. Maybe brilliant at what he does, mm. uh, unbelievable carrier. But the other side of his game maybe hasn't been as polished. Maybe the the distribution, the playmaking probably won't see that if he if he is at thirteen for the lines. But yeah, I like him there, a real physical guy. Mm. We're going to take a, a couple of questions from our audience. Uh, Brian Duffy has been on. How do you expect to, uh, Joe to treat the summer tour? Given we will have some of our bigger players on lines duty, who should we expect to take advantage of this? Yeah, I think um, I think he'll he'll continue similar to what what he's done before. I think it was um, uh, who uh, it was Marmion, I think, wasn't it? Who got his 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 first start? In uh, in South Africa, um, yeah. uh, down in Argentina, was he? No, he wasn't there. Um, uh, yeah, but it's usually yeah. a, it's a, usually an example to 
a, a chance to use those guys and use those guys and just put a few players. So I think he'll use it definitely as that because obviously we've got two years away and um, before 2019. Um, you know, there's no doubt about this. It's going to be a huge distraction looking at at the Lions tour, but in a way, that's an opportunity for Ireland to be able to really just get lots and lots of game time under new guys coming through. Yeah, who are the guys? I guess Rory Scanlon's a guy who's been really going well with Munster. He'll probably uh, look at having a chance there. Andrew Conway will want to add to cap number one. He didn't get too much chance to, to attack onto the ball. Are the other guys maybe up front, back row, Dan Levy? Like, they're actually guys who have one or two caps who maybe need that experience. So Joe has already given 20 new caps since the World Cup, but we may not see too many over in Japan. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard to know what his master plan is, isn't it? I, I do see a lot of players, a lot of new players getting getting game time because I think it's a real, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a fairly unique opportunity two years out to be able to get yeah. that. Interestingly, yeah, uh, James Ryan, the Ireland under-20 captain from last year, was spotted in the Viva after the stadium uh -huh. down on pitch side. So maybe one to watch out for. He's been injured, bad hamstring injury, so this tour is probably, probably too early for him. But thanks to Brian for that question. We've got another one from a reader called Blue Pool Road. Interesting name. How did Joe Schmidt perform over the Six Nations? How did Joe Schmidt perform over the Six Nations? That's an interesting question. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Um, the ultimate professional, I think, as always. Um, ever complimentary and ever... ever complimentary of, of other teams and then equally uh, uh, humble in, in when they did so well and so so delighted for the players to have done so well. I think he sees he sees maximum potential in all of the, all of his players. He just wants them to actually show it and bring it to the fore and I think that's that's um, echoed across all of the team. Um, I think we saw more creativity. We saw more flex around game plan. We saw more flex around individual players, which I think is something that, that um, is really, really promising. So yeah. good performance for Joe. Yeah, it was, it was a variety, certainly, in the way we attacked. And he was made, made sure he insistently said, you know, we've been playing wide, go have a look at the games. He did come up for, uh, under a little bit more criticism than general. I certainly felt from fans, mm. uh, you know, he has been the kind of St. Joe figure, but... I don't know, when Ireland lose, people get so upset. There was a bit more criticism of, even of his coaching style. A couple of the English journals had a go, actually, in, in the Telegraph. I, I read one, one piece about his management of, of the players off the pitch and how, I suppose, disciplined he is, how intense he is. Um, I guess that's just his style. Like, mm. These Irish players are used to I don't think any of them would say... Get rid of Joe. He, he's their guy, really, until until 2019. Certainly, I think it's it showed time and time again. It's what Ireland needed. I think Ireland have emotion in abundance. I think there's not an Irish person on this um, in this country that hasn't got plenty of patriotism and ability and to give everything that we've got for our country. Um, that that is not sustainable. That's not what you want in a rugby pitch. You want structure. You want basics done exceptionally well, so that you, you can just put them in your back pocket and say, okay, what to next? So the combination of structure and emotion and emotive games and the ability to just um, roll people up and then pull them back down when you need to is really really important. So I think he's been the stalwart of that. So I think it's been hugely hugely positive for Irish rugby. Good job, Joe. Unfortunately, that's all time we have time for today. Uh, Lynn, thanks so much for coming in. Pleasure. And thanks to Facebook for having us into their beautiful studio again today. Also, thanks to everyone who tuned in over the course of the Six Nations. It's been great fun. We'll catch you again soon. Cheers.